Hello everyone, happy holidays and welcome back. Today I'm going to show you how to make a Plotly Dash web application for data visualization in just 20 lines of Python code. This is what we're going to make today, a data visualization for historical COVID cases in each state of the United States. This chart is fully interactive. By hovering your mouse over the line, you will see more details like the date and the exact COVID case counts. I created this web app using only three Python libraries, Pandas, Plotly, and Dash. To clarify, Plotly and Dash are two different libraries, but they integrate seamlessly. I'm going to show you how to make this chart in just three steps. We're going to start with something very simple and iterate on it. The first step, We'll create a simple dash web application or a web app which is really a fancy word for a website i don't know why people call it web app in my days people just call it website anyways the second step we'll learn how to get the data clean up and transform the data and make a plot from the data we're going to use the plotly library to make the plot so i'll also show you how to integrate the plotly graph with our web app in the last step We'll cover how to link the drop down menu with our graph such that when we change the selection, our graph will update accordingly. All right, let's dive right into it. Let's import a couple of things from Dash. The HTML is a class for creating HTML components in Python. The DCC or the Dash Core Components class is used to create dynamic contents such as interactive graphs, drop down menus, etc. First of all, we create a dash object and call it app. Then we define the layout of this app. You can think about this app being the website or the web page itself. And the layout is how we want the web page to look like. If you already know some HTML, that's great. If you don't, no big deal. It's pretty easy to understand. We we'll use a dash HTML object to create HTML components such as the div, headings, tables, etc. The div means division or simply a section on a web page. Whenever you see the tag div, it means the start of a new section. The h1 means the heading tag. Basically, whatever text we put in the h1 tag will be in large and bold font. We can use the dash core components or the DCC object to create a drop down box. We're going to assign a name or ID to it. This ID doesn't affect how the drop down box works or looks but will be used to link the drop-down value with the graph later on. The options argument basically contains the items available in the drop-down list. Let's put the name of three states in here, California, New York, Illinois. The options argument is a list of dictionaries which contain a label and value pair. So we're done with the layout for our simple app. Then we'll call the app.runserver method which is used to create and start a Flask web server in the backend. To start this web app, we can simply press F5 in our IDE, or if you're using a virtual environment, you can just go to the command prompt and run Python plus the script name. Either way, it will work. Briefly after we run the script, we should see this message that Dash is running on this address 127.0.0.1, which is sometimes also referred to as the local host. And 8050 is just a default port number. We don't have to change it. So we can either copy and paste this URL into a web browser, or we can just use the word localhost to replace the IP address, which will also work. Setting the debug equal to true will make our coding process easier. Basically, every time we make a coding change, we don't have to stop and relaunch the app, just refresh the web page and we should see the change reflected on our page. This is our simple web app, just a static page, and you can right click on anywhere of the web page and inspect. A lot of browsers should offer this functionality, Chrome, Safari, Firefox, or Microsoft Edge. This shows the HTML code for this web page. So this is the first div, it says hello world, and this is the h1 tag, then this is that drop down box. Whenever we need to stop the web app, just go to the console screen and press Ctrl and C. You might need to press it a few times to stop the web app. To make the chart for the daily COVID cases, we're going to use the Plotly library. First thing first, we need to get the data. The source data is from Johns Hopkins University COVID GitHub repository. This repository is maintained by the Johns Hopkins University 
and is updated pretty much daily to track the COVID cases around the world. We're going into the COVID-19 data folder, then COVID time series, then COVID confirmed US. Right now, this file is too big to show on the GitHub page, but we can still inspect it by just click on the link, view raw, then notice the URL. This is essentially a CSV file, which means we can use pandas to read the file into Python. We're going to switch to Jupyter Notebook because it's easier to show the plot along with our code. In the notebook, let's import pandas and plotly.express. We can read the COVID case numbers data by calling the pd.readcsv function, then pass in the file URL from the GitHub repository. Take a look at the data. There are 3,300 rows and 700 columns. There are lots of useless columns for our project, so we need to do some data cleanup. The state names are inside this proving state column, and there are a bunch of columns with COVID case counts. It seems like each column represents the case counts for a given day. This admin two columns seems to be the county names within the state. We don't care about that level of granularity, so we'll be aggregating the case counts into a single state for a given day. We can use the group by function to aggregate data by state. The argument as index equal to false means do not use the proving state as a new index. Then we want to sum up everything for each state. The resulting table looks like this. Now we're down to only state level case counts. And these values are probably wrong because we added up everything, but we don't need them for this project. So we'll be just ignoring them. However, there is still another problem. All the case counts are still in separate columns. And it's like the data is going horizontally instead of vertically. And it's going to make plotting difficult. We need to have the case counts inside a single column with the corresponding dates in a separate column beside it, something like this. It's sort of like unpivoting this row such that we can have all the dates and daily counts going down vertically instead of going horizontally. And the pandas melt function does exactly this. We pass in the state level data frame, keep the proving state column, then unpivot the date columns. To do that, we need to feed in all the date columns into the value vars argument. And this line here looks at the last two characters of each column name. If they end with either 20 or 21, meaning the year 2020 or 2021, then we know it's a date column that contains the COVID case counts. So we keep only the date columns and remove everything else. Let's check the unpivoted table again. Now there are only three columns left, the state names, the variable column, which contains the date, and the value column, which contains the case counts. And that's all the data we need for the plot. We're going to use the plot express or the px object for plotting. Fig equal to px.line, and we pass in the data frame that we just cleaned up. So here, we're just going to display one sample state. Otherwise, the data will be super crowded. And let's look at only California for now. So x-axis is the date or the variable column and the y-axis is a case count or the value column. Now we need to call fig.show to display the chart. This chart is actually the cumulative case counts as opposed to the daily new case counts. If you want to show the new daily case counts, then we just need to calculate the difference between each dates. And we can do that easily with the diff method. All right, so now we have the chart. Let's move this into our Dash website. I'm going to copy all the necessary code into the Dash app, which is currently open in the idle. And we're going to remove the figure.show function because otherwise, each time we run this app, a separate window will pop up with a chart. Now, in our Dash app layout, we're going to add another Dash core component, the graph. And we'll also assign an ID to it and pass in the Plotly Express figure data. We're going to refresh the web page and now the COVID case counts graph is alive within this dash app. One more thing we need to do now, there are only three states in the dropdown. We need to bring all the state names into our app. Let's get all the state names. We can check the unique values in the proving state column. This gives us the unique state values. Then we have to put these names into a list of dictionaries to feed into the dropdown options. We could use a for loop to do that, but I'll show you how to do it using list comprehension, which is a neat way of looping in Python. So we're going to create this dictionary with label and value pair using each of the state names. As we create these dictionaries, they're also being added into a list called labels. Then we update the dropdown option 
to equal to labels, save the file, refresh the page. As of now, although we have all the state names inside this dropdown, it doesn't really do anything as we select a new state name and the chart is still showing California case counts. What we want to achieve is that whenever we choose a new state in the dropdown, the graph should update accordingly to show data for that state. And this magic is done using dash callback functions, which are automatically called by dash whenever a user provides an input to update some properties in another component. It means that when user update the dropdown menu, the graph will update accordingly. The way to implement the callback functionality in Dash is quite simple. We just need to add a decorator right before a function which does the actual update. First of all, we need to import two other objects called input and output from the Dash library. Note it's from dash.dependencies as opposed to just from Dash. The input object refers to the stuff that the user is going to update. In our case, the state name in the dropdown menu. The output object refers to the things that should be updated, which is the graph itself. So let's write the decorator first at app.callback. And the first argument is the output. Inside output, the first argument is the ID of the element. So going back to our web page, this is going to be the graph or the fig1 in our code. Then we specify the output type is a figure. The second argument in the callback function is the input object. Similar to the output object, the first argument for input is the ID of the element, which is the dropdown, and the data type is a value. Immediately after the decorator, we need to write a function to actually do the update. The function name doesn't really matter here. I'm just calling it update graph, and it must have some arguments. The number of arguments depends on the number of input object we have in the callback decorator. In our case, we only have one input, so we just need one argument for this function. And the name of the argument also doesn't matter, but I'm going to call it states because that's what the data is. Depending on your situation, you can have many inputs at once, but then you also need to have equal number of arguments for your update function. Basically, this function will filter data based on the given state, then regenerate a new figure using data for just that state. We can add a title that will also update the state name as we update the dropdown menu. At the end of the function, we must return some data. In our case, the data is a plotly figure object. So to understand this callback mechanism, the input value basically is whatever a user selects on the web page. If we select, for example, Illinois from the dropdown, then that value is going to get passed into the callback decorator as an input, which is further passed into the argument of the callback function. Then the callback function does its thing to update stuff. Of course, you can write the callback function to update pretty much anything on the web page. And in our example, it just happens to be the chart. Once the callback function completes the data update, it will return the data, which is a plotly figure object to the callback decorator, which will then update the graph on the website. So that completes the full cycle of the interactive feature of Dash. If you watch to this point, Congratulations. You just learned how to make a fully interactive chart to showcase the cumulative COVID case counts for each state in the US. And what's amazing is that we were able to achieve something like this with just under 20 lines of Python code, all thanks to awesome libraries. This might look bad formatting, but I have removed all the spaces to just show you that it takes literally 20 lines of code to do this. If you enjoyed the video, please smash the like button and share the video with your friends. It's going to help the channel and I really appreciate it. Thanks for watching. I wish you a happy holiday and I'll see you in the next one.